Good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Weber. I'm the executive director of SFU Public Square, and we are a proud supporter of tonight's event. It is my honor to invite Elder Margaret George, a member of the Squawk First Nation, to provide us with an opening prayer. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the territory of the First Nations people, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam, and the shared territory of Vancouver. It's an honor to be here with you this evening. A quick prayer, and we can continue our event. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Just guide each and every one of us on our thoughts and our actions, letting us always remember that we are working for the people and helping them to make it a lot better for them during this very difficult time. It's an honor to be present with all our leaders and just a very special blessing on each and every one of you who is present today and your communities from which you come from and your families, a very special blessing on the young ones, the ones who witness what we do and what we say. I ask Great Spirit just to keep us safe, all my relations. Thank you for inviting me. Our thanks to Elder Margaret for starting us off in a good way as she has done so many times. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And as a settler here, I'll be focused tonight on understanding more about how our topic intersects with the continued colonization of these lands. We are broadcasting live from 312 Maine in Vancouver. 312 Maine is a community-centered hub for social and economic innovation located in the downtown east side. Our SFU Public Square team works out of this space, along with other SFU units, including Lifelong Learning, Van City Office of Community Engagement, the SFU Library Community Scholars Program, and the Community Engaged Research Initiative. So welcome to all of you and all of you, and thank you for being here with us for property, home, and precarity, from street sweeps to housing justice. We have a small in-person audience here, and we have many of you joining us on Zoom. For those online, please feel free to introduce yourself into the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Tonight's event is special for a number of reasons. First, because it's our final event of 2021 and the final event of our 2021 Community Summit series called Towards Equity. Our annual Community Summit is a multi-day, or in this case, a multi-month exploration of complex social challenges and potential solutions through programming that leverages the research excellence of SFU and the lived experience of our community partners. This year, we've been asking, what must we understand and do to recover equitably from the pandemic and reimagine our systems to confront the intersecting crises of inequality, systemic racism, and climate change. Tonight's topic, housing precarity, is one where these crises intersect very visibly. The other reason tonight is special is because this event is part of our classroom partnership program. We are thrilled to have been able to co-create this event with Dr. Nicholas Blomley and the students in this semester's fourth year geography class, Property Land Society. These incredible students have been engaged in research on housing precarity and will be sharing uh, it with us tonight. I've had a chance to go around and see the presentations. They are amazing and I cannot wait to hear more. Before I pass you over to Nick and his students, I'll quickly cover some housekeeping notes. To make this event more accessible, we do have closed captioning available, um, which you can access by going to the panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen and clicking the little CC button. We ask that everyone respect the community guidelines that you received when you registered for this event so that we can have a safe, honest, and socially accountable dialogue together this evening. And we remind everyone who's with us in person to please keep your masks on at all times, except for when you're eating uh, or drinking, which you have to do at your seat, and then your mask goes back on when you're done. This event is being recorded and will be shared on SFU Public Square's YouTube channel and we'll send it out in a link to everyone in the next few days. 
A huge thanks to our SFU Woodward's team for all the amazing AV and technical support. We could not do our work without you. Um, and now to take us through the event, I'll pass the mic to our moderator this evening, Dr. Nicholas Blomley, who is a professor of geography at SFU and has a long standing interest in property and precarity. He is currently involved in community based research projects concerning SROs in the downtown east side and the seizure of precariously housed people's possessions. Please welcome Nicholas Blomley. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, welcome to those of you here in person and to those of you joining us online. My thanks to Elder Margaret George for starting us off in the right way with that uh, traditional acknowledgement and the, um, the prayer. Um, uh, my name is Nick Blomley. I'm a professor at SFU. I'm your moderator for this event. Um, so thanks also to the organizers of SFU Public Square, notably Seth and Sakshi, but the whole crew have worked very, very hard on this project. Um, my thanks to uh, the presenters, all of them senior SFU students, who I've had the very good fortune of working with uh, over this past semester, and they've worked really very hard too. Uh, my thanks also to the panelists who I will introduce very, very soon. Um, let me briefly explain the context for this event before we get going. As was mentioned, it comes out of a class, an undergraduate class I teach at SFU, I have been just, we just wrapped up on Friday. The class really focuses on property and, and power. And our home, which is supposedly, of course, a place of security and support, has become increasingly vulnerable for Vancouverites. This prevailing system works well for the privileged few, but forces many others into precarity and vulnerability. And we often think about housing vulnerability in relation to property markets, like housing supply or housing costs. And all of these are important. But we often ignore the workings of property relations or property law in structuring forms of privilege and precarity. Property entails a set of relations between people in regards to a valued resource like land. And you can structure it in many ways. You can empower the collective, you can grant access, but under dominant systems of colonialism and capitalism, property relations are organized so as to privilege settler societies in general and private property owners in particular. Now this can create what we in this class have been calling precarious property relations. And I'm not gonna give you a 50 minute lecture, but very simply the argument is that we all need to access land for shelter, but the terms under which we do, under which this happens varies. Many, maybe most people access shelter and land through negotiations with powerful dominant property interests creating a precarious property relationship, one of asymmetry and unevenness, where certain people and interests are given greater power over others. They can remove access to land, they can place others in heightened vulnerability. Renters and houseless people, for example, live under highly precarious property relations, and we'll learn more about that uh, this evening. So we're gonna explore certain dimensions of property, home, and precarity, uh, with a focus on Metro Vancouver in particular. And this is how the evening is going to proceed. Shortly, I'm going to introduce our panel, all of whom have experience and knowledge of this subject in various ways. And then we're going to be listening to and engaging with four brief presentations put together by the student groups in my class. What they're going to do is they're going to explore four key sites in which questions of precarious property are expressed and contested. Street sweeps, rental evictions, housing financialization, and finally, housing justice movements. After the discussion at around about 8.30, those of us in person are going to engage with the student groups more informally. They prepared some research posters, which for those of us here, I encourage you to stay and, uh, and view. Uh, and those online are gonna be able to access the posters, including links to supplemental material online, and I'll explain how that happens later on. But let me now for introduce our panelists. And maybe I can start first with, with Manakshi. Um, so Manakshi Mano is the, uh, the criminalization and policing cam campaigner at Pivot Legal Society. Manakshi, take a seat, thanks. She's also a member of the Vancouver Prison Justice Day Committee, the Stark Raven Media Collective at uh, Co-op Radio and Defund 604 Network. In a role at Pivot, Manakshi works alongside her colleagues to envision intersectional approaches to ending the harms of policing and criminalization. 
and she values Pivot's uncompromising commitment to the expertise and vision of people with lived and living experience. Her work relates to the impact of policing on all aspects of Pivot's campaigns, and they do phenomenal work. Manakshi's work includes producing public legal education materials, policy analysis, and community engagement. So it's great to have you here, Manakshi. Um, our second panelist is Delilah. Delilah, can you join us? Delilah Gregg is a carrier woman and a member of the Nakosli First Nation. Uh, she's a mother to one son and has been living in Vancouver for more than 50 years. She's a member of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, or VANDU, also a phenomenal organization, and currently sits on its board of directors and also serves as the vice president of the Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction Society, or WARS, and is a member of Our Homes Can't Wait Coalition. Delilah is a frontline harm reduction worker at Van Du, Spikes on Bikes, and the Maple Needle Exchange. And Delilah believes that people who stigmatize substance use must stop and accept people as they are. She's working towards a world where people are always treated with compassion and support, and her philosophy is that life is too short to judge people. Don't sweat the small stuff. So it's great you're here, Delilah. Thanks so much. And finally, but not least, Maggie, Maggie Ramirez. Um, Maggie is an assistant professor of geography at SFU and a phenomenal colleague of mine, who I'm very grateful to have um, in my workspace. And Maggie's work explores how racial capitalism and, and colonialism structure urban space, as well as how Black, Indigenous, and Latinx peoples weave liberatory movements and envision urban futures. And she is co-editor of the anti-eviction mapping project Counterpoint, a Bay Area Atlas of Displacement and Resistance, which connects to one of the housing justice presentations, I'm sure. Otherwise, she's engaged in anti-colonial and anti-displacement organizing in Oakland, California, and spends her day parenting two remarkable small humans. So Maggie, it's wonderful uh, you're here. So um, maybe we can just sit down and have a brief chat. We have just a few minutes before our first presentation in uh, five minutes or so. So thank you. It's wonderful you're here. Delilah, why don't you take your mask off? Are you feeling comfortable? Are you yeah. going to leave it on? Uh, yeah, I'm just, it, I don't like wearing these masks, but they're forced to wear and I'm, I'm breaking no, out. No, you should leave it on. My <laughs> so... apologies. Absolutely leave it on if that's how you feel comfortable. So, um, so we're going to be talking about property and power. These are very big concepts. Um, um, why don't we start with a big question? Who owns Vancouver? Who should own Vancouver? The people. The people? Yeah, definitely yeah. the people. People should own Vancouver? Um, well, I think they should own a great majority of it. And, you know, until the, um, um, and let the government know how they should be doing things. Uh -huh. Just in, in my world, in my head, right? So. Okay. <laughs> okay. But do the people own Vancouver now? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. No. Would be nice, though. It would be nice. I wonder what difference it would make. Uh, it's hard to say. Could either be good or bad, or in between, right? Because with everything in life, there's always good and bad. True. So. True. Yeah. Maggie, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the people should own the city. I think, I think of cities more broadly. I think. Um, and how, given that we are living in indigenous territories, that there's not only just generally the people should own the city, but also following the protocols of, mm. of whose lands we live upon, right? And being cognizant of, of how um, indigenous territories make up all cities on this continent. So um, yeah, I mean, those are the kind of features I wanna be a part of, so. Um, I and mean, actually we're talking about vulnerability and precarity here. Pivot, of course, is, uh, works very hard on a whole number of fronts, but how would vulnerability and precarity intersect with, with, with your work and with Pivot's work more generally? I think it links to the state, or in this case, like also capital's ability to repossess your home if it's deemed fit to do so. Um, and I think that when we're considering like who should own the city, um, we also have to reframe what ownership looks like. Mm -hmm. um, like I like the framework of stewardship uh -huh. and I think like who should steward the city. We open this event with like a prayer um, with an acknowledgement that we're on unceded land. And right now we're in a place that was known as Lek Lucky to yes, honor the cedar grove that was here. And 
those are territories that were stewarded right by indigenous people um and it looks a lot different than like fee simple property ownership or my relationship which is like a numbered company gets most of my money every month um and i don't know who they are um and i i think like yeah who owns the city is also about like well what does ownership mean because yes. we have this like really colonial mindset that's like um about dominance but like who owns the city who stewards the city is also about like who has a ongoing responsibility to the people who are here so you're thinking about reframing the idea of property itself it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very radical idea and also abolishing the police <laughs> well, i would be remiss if i didn't say that um as one of the you know caretakers of this whole system that right. deprives people of housing yeah because property is propped up by the state of course isn't it i mean a set of power relations sustain the, the a dominant relations sustain the power relations we're going to be we're going to be talking about so absolutely thinking about the role of the police um, in sustaining a system uh, yeah, absolutely yeah yeah i'm yeah, pushing beyond the whole idea of ownership right abolishing the whole concept of that any one person or people should own anything and what like delilah is saying about you know humans are also fallible mm -hmm. and so you can't just assume that one you know one form of like colonial dominant ownership yes. can replace another like mm -hmm. i've been through my building being resold actually and i'm like it didn't really change mm -hmm. but it could have i could have lost my home so mm -hmm. you know what does that transfer of ownership actually mean it's it's more than that yes yeah but of course people even in this system have very different relationships to property so mm -hmm. somebody who has a simple title has a different relationship to someone who's a tenant and someone who's in a financialized building, as we'll learn in a, in a little while, where the landlord is trying to get as much money as they can from that uh, asset, which is the way it's being described, are likely going to put people in even more precarious mm -hmm. relationship. And that can trickle right down to, to people's experiences of, of, of being kicked out of SROs, and life on the street, and so on, too. If that's a relationship of power and property as well, we need to think about it. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you. Let's 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 maybe now begin with our first um, our first group. And the first student group was tasked with researching street sweeps. And uh, the group comprises Yue Zhang, uh, Nobu Jono, Yvonne Huang, Claire Aplis, and Victor Yin. And uh, I'd like to invite Victor to join us and present the findings of their their research project. So, Victor. The floor is, is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Victor, and I'll be presenting on behalf of my team, Claire, Yvonne, Nobu, and Evelyn um, on street sweeps. Uh, so through our research, we found that street sweeps challenged the rights to dignity, ownership, and property of unhoused people. So what are street sweeps? Street sweeps are about getting rid of visible homelessness in the streets. Uh, and that's through the seizure and destruction of people's personal property, uh, particularly belonging to those who are unhoused uh, and who must store their personal belongings in public spaces. So in Vancouver's downtown east side, city workers and the VPD work together to perform sweeps sometimes multiple times a day. And this is done by going down streets block by block with disposal trucks to clear the streets of people's belongings, uh, sometimes with only a few minutes notice. Uh, people have reported having essential things like IDs, sleeping bags, tents, mobility devices, and other highly personal mentos uh, taken away due to street sweeps. So why do cities use street sweeps and how are street sweeps justified? Uh, we've identified two main reasons, attractiveness and cleanliness. Uh, the first reason is the attractiveness of the cities. We found that processes of gentrification, capitalism, and the over-financialization of housing uh, to all be major drivers in perpetuating street sweeping. Because of the downtown east side's proximity to the downtown core, uh, the government, investors, business owners, and residents, and other members of the growth machine 
uh, advocate for street sweeping and the removal of homeless people uh, because they feel that unhoused people negatively affect uh, the attractiveness and livability of the city. For example, the opening of a condominium development on Hastings was linked to increased street sweeping in the area. Another reason is cleanliness. Uh, because um, these homeless encampments oftentimes have pests, trash, human waste, uh, needles, and the like, uh, these sweeps are often uh, justified as a response to uh, a public health crisis. Um, however, it is really important to recognize how services like adequate public bathrooms or a proper waste disposal are often under-delivered in areas like the downtown east side to begin with. And so what are some of the consequences of street sweeps? Street sweeps are not very regulated. The rules and regulations around street sweeps, if they exist, are largely set by each city and are oftentimes vague. So as a result, street sweeps can happen with very little notice in poor weather very early in the day. And this can place people, unhoused people, uh, in situations of vulnerability and precarity if they need to suddenly gather other belongings uh, and find other shelter. With street, street sweeps, people have their ownership and they can be challenged uh, through having their things raided and discarded. Personal possessions are not garbage. They are a way of building life and home and identity. For those who are unhoused, personal property becomes even more important and necessary for one's survival. And when these things need to be replaced, this takes up time and resources that could otherwise be used uh, for other activities like finding housing, looking for jobs, taking care of each other, um, or even socializing. Possessions can also become commodities uh, for some unhoused people because street vending can be a main source of income. Street vendors sell their goods on the streets and street sweeps interfere um, with this activity um, and interfere with people's livelihoods and people's personal and economic agency as a result. Property relations involve vulnerability and privilege and the street sweeps that happen in the downtown east side reflect the vulnerability that is created for those who are unhoused. So what are some solutions to street sweeps? The solution to street sweeps would really just to be ending street sweeps all together. And this would have to occur at a policy level um, within the city of Vancouver or at other levels of government. Um, there's already been a lot of push to ending street sweeps um, by organizations and residents. For example, organizations like the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, Vendu, um, and Pivot Legal Society have used media outlets and other news conferences to bring awareness about street sweeps uh, and to really push for the ending of these sweeps. In the meantime, finding intermediary solutions can also help with mitigating the impacts and the harm that people face from this practice. Uh, so we've identified three potential solutions to reduce the impacts of street sweeps, but these are not an alternative to ending street sweeps altogether. The first potential solution could be better carts for those who are unhoused. So for example, the UBC Carts Project um, seeks to redesign the traditional grocery cart uh, into something that's safer and more durable so that unhoused people can safely and securely store their belongings. The second could be storage facilities. Many cities are st starting to fund storage facilities for unhoused people uh, where they can access lockers or bins uh, to safely secure their things. And the third could be community integration, and this can build off of street vending. So creating and supporting a more permanent market, split, market space will allow people to participate in the informal economy um, and the legitimization of street vending can empower people, restore dignity and better integrate unhoused people into the community. So in conclusion, street sweeps challenge the rights to dignity, ownership and property of unhoused people and respecting people's rights to personal property brings empowerment and encourages community support. After the presentation, we also have a research poster with some more information uh, on our research, and we would be happy to talk to you if you have any questions. And you can also scan the QR code on the slide uh, to access our full paper. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Victor. Um, I would like to invite two other members of the group, Yvonne Huang and Claire Aplis, to join us on stage, uh, stage left, your stage right, <laughs> for a few follow-up uh, questions. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful you're here. I've also been told, by the way, panelists, that we need to speak a little louder because apparently our mics aren't working quite as much as they should. So please, please do articulate. Yvonne, Claire, wonderful you're here. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Hi, thank you so much for having us. That's really great to be here. Oh. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my name is Yvonne. And um, like it was mentioned, we are part of the Geography 440 class. And we are representing the Street Sweeps group. Wonderful. OK. OK, well, um, let's think of uh, some questions. Uh, but actually, I imagine you might have a couple of questions, given uh, Pivot's role in this uh, uh, Street Sweeps project or, uh, more recently in the, in the downtown east side. Do you want to kick off, maybe? Sure. Yeah, fantastic presentation. It's really great to see um, that the work that many folks did, especially during this last October, has kind of disseminated. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how folks resist street sweeps um, and what you learned in doing your research. Um, so I think one main way that I found people have been resisting, and this has been like um, a long time practice, I guess, is using public art. So I think that's like a very easily accessible way to resist because, you know, I mean, anyone can take I guess paint cans or something and create some art um, and that is one way to communicate important messages such as how items are not just items but they have deeper meaning for people who are unhoused and um, by spreading these messages then the wider population can understand that street sweeps aren't a okay practice. Yeah, just building off of that, I think with public art, it really helps to um, challenge like the dominant culture that, you know, possessions are debris um, and change it to an idea that um, it destigmatizes on people being unhoused and homeless in the area. Um, Maggie, do you want to chip in? Yeah, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what services would help prevent the need for street sweeps, what could be implemented? Um, yeah, absolutely. So like Victor mentioned, um, some of the biggest challenges with the downtown east side and downtown Vancouver and kind of cities everywhere is the lack of services, um, like having enough garbage cans or recycling bins or um, uh, places to put your compost um, so that they can and have them regularly, routinely and picked up often so that they don't become overflowing and um, garbage littered all over the street. So that's one of it. Um, another way that we've come across is empowering people to do um, micro cleans themselves. There's actually a group in Vancouver called United We Can. And so they help to employ people who face boundaries to traditional employment. Um, and so these people, they work across Chinatown, the downtown east side and uh, parts of Gastown. And they um, do micro cleans through the streets and lanes. So that way they can do it on a smaller and slower scale. So people can actually separate garbage and debris from belongings um, and like, I think it was about 380 bags of garbage are collected a week by this group. So it's not insignificant. It's really powerful. Yeah. Well, you mentioned United We Can because we lost Ken Leotier, who was the founder of United We Can just a few days ago, uh, last, uh, last week. So uh, that's a very important organization. Um, uh, Delia, do you want, did you have questions you wanted to, to chip in or um, um, I'm happy to... Um, when you were taught, what was it called, micro... They're called micro cleanups. Um, so it's allowing people who might not um, have, a, have an easy time getting into a traditional job, they can kind of start to get employment through this. And so they'll go through the lanes, they'll go through streets and do garbage collection on a small scale. Um, and this allows people to be empowered in themselves and to gain employment, as well as to create a more human aspect to this, as opposed to just having a garbage truck drive through the street and take everyone's belongings. Um, would that be the Binners project, I think, or is that? I think, I think there's the Binners project. Um, I think that might be part of it. There might be a few organizations, but yeah, the one I came across was the microcleans from United okay. We Can. Okay. What does it say about our society that um, a houseless person's stuff is far less important than my stuff?
<laughs> it's a big question and it's a good question. Um, I think in part of our research that uh, I found was NIMBYism was a big driver in this. So that's, so NIMBY stands for not in my backyard where people seem to be accepting of um, social problems and social solutions as long as they aren't happening in proximity to them. Um, and so with that people are, yeah, they'd rather see problems just pushed out of sight, out of mind. And it's kind of dehumanizing in that. I think you're right. Yeah. And just to add on to that, I also think um, it matters what your identity is. So definitely um, unhoused residents, um, if they have more marginalized identities, such as um, being a BIPOC person, then their value as a person, um, it kind of like decreases and they're more dehumanized. So yeah. I think yeah. that's also appropriate. Thank you, right. Okay, thank you very much. Pretty grateful for your uh, hard work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. A tight timetable there, I feel like I'm <laughs> managing trains, but uh, <laughs> thank you, that was wonderful. Our second uh, group unpacked the often neglected topic, but increasingly important topic, I think, of rental evictions. And that group comprised uh, Zoe Muckle and Amber Muckle, Andrew Battle, uh, Leanna Dallantonia, and Greg Hansen. And Greg is going to present their findings. So, Greg, the floor is yours. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Greg. I am representing the rental evictions group. And the goal of our project was to take this concept of precarity, which was mentioned earlier, this kind of idea that we have to access property through other people. And we want to understand what the consequences of this relationship is. Uh, and in order to ground this in the real world, we chose Metro Vancouver as a case study. And the goal of this is to understand where evictions occur and to whom they occur to. There we go. So whenever we think about property, we have to consider what our position to property is. And this can come in different forms. For example, I have to think about my own position to property when I speak about it. Uh, I live at home with my parents and I, we live in a detached house that we mortgage. So technically, if my parents don't pay for it, the, the bank takes control of it. So what may seem like a rather stable form of housing is actually quite vulnerable. Um, and from this, we also have to consider other types of housing. For example, there are formal arrangements such as renting or owning houses or uh, property. And there's also more informal and often more vulnerable arrangements such as squatting or being unhoused. And this is all to underscore the fact that we all have some kind of relationship to property. And these different relationships have varying degrees of vulnerability. And as a result, there are very few people who truly escape property. And I guess the key idea is that we're all stuck in the storm, but we have different ships to weather it. So with this relational idea of property in mind, we can begin to think about the causes of rental eviction. Uh, rental eviction, is often cast as something which results from individual factors. And this can involve the non-payment of rent, for example. Uh, in a situation like that, the person breaks the contract, which allows them to occupy a space, and they're thus removed. And this puts a lot of blame on the individual. And as such, we have to think about systemic factors, things that go beyond individual causes. And uh, this. Uh, we come from a geographical perspective, so we do have to appreciate space in this respect. And the classic example that we always think about is gentrification. We think about the way that capital moves into a neighborhood and revitalizes it, and at the expense of existing people within that neighborhood. Um, for example, the cost of existing housing may go up, thus pricing people out of the neighborhood, or uh, people may experience rent evictions, whereby the people that exist within the current properties 
are evicted and their houses are then demolished for new development. And this is all to say that there are many factors that can cause rental eviction that go beyond just an individual's inability to pay rent. So from this, we want to take uh, all this background theory and put it into the actual world, obviously. And to do this, we focus on the Canadian context and specific, uh, specifically we think we uh, related this to Vancouver. Um, in particular, we draw on a study that came out from UBC this year, which attempted to examine trends in rental evictions uh, throughout Canada based on the Canadian Housing Survey of 2018. And behind this, the study wished to uh, understand where evictions occur and who is affected by these evictions. And the graph you see here is a representation of estimates made about where evictions occur. And as was found in the study, approximately 10.5% of renters in Vancouver were evicted from their house within a five-year period prior to the study. And this is a rather staggering number. And frankly, it's the highest number amongst other urban areas within the country. So this is the where of the problem. And Vancouver, in case we haven't uh, recognized how expensive it's getting, is obviously a, a place where this problem is centralized. So from this, we also have to understand who is actually affected. And what our research, what we found through this study is that there is an uneven and unequal distribution in the eviction rates based on demographic groups. Uh, for example, when looking at ethnicity, indigenous people had a particular vulnerability and a higher rate to evictions. Uh, when looking at immigration categories, refugees had greater vulnerability than other categories. Further, uh, education levels were relevant in that lower educational attainment was often associated with a higher rate of eviction. And family composition is also a relevant factor in this respect, because there's an intersection of single male fathers that in particular face a higher rates of eviction. And the other inequality behind this is an inequality in the well being of renters. Uh, people who have been evicted often face economic hardships and worse physical and mental health outcomes. And this is all to say that demographic groups, uh, people from various demographic groups, experience certain vulnerabilities to rental evictions. So from this, the main finding of our study is that evictions are an intersectional issue that simultaneously perpetuate and exacerbate existing inequities in society. And this is to say that uh, people who find themselves at the intersection of these vulnerable demographics often have uh, particularly compounding vulnerabilities when it comes to accessing property and housing. And as well, this is to state that there is a kind of two-way relationship whereby being evicted leads to greater vulnerability and this vulnerability carries over into future housing arrangements. Um, lastly, while we, can, while we developed this project, we came across several resources, most of which are more on a uh, basis of support for people who experience uh, rental eviction. Uh, and we want to share this QR code, which leads to these resources, but these resources are also available on our poster and we're happy to talk about them. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So I'd like to invite two other members of the group, Zoe. Muckle and Andrew Battle to join us for some conversation. Welcome. Thank you for all your hard work. Whoa, careful. <laughs> yeah, there's an extra. Hello. Hello. Wonderful you're here. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. You're very welcome. Um, so, uh, evictions are. Uh, a big issue. Um, they affect many people. It sounds like uh, a large proportion of renters in 
in Vancouver have experienced evictions. Of course, people also are threatened with eviction as well. So evictions are not just actually important in terms of uh, their realization, but also their um, uh, the way in which they're they're mobilized by uh, by landlords. Um, uh, I'm interested to get the panelists' thoughts on on uh, on evictions or questions for uh, for, for uh, Zoe and, and Andrew. Would like to uh, to kick off. Sir, thank you so much for your presentation. You did a lot of really important work. Um, so we're looking at some of the statistics that you showed us, and I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more to why there's such a relatively high rate of um, of Indigenous people being evicted in Vancouver. Yes, yeah, so good question. We did some research and I came across the Canadian Rental Housing Index, which has a lot of information as to renter percentages. So specifically BC is the third largest province in Canada. So we were kind of looking at population percentages. Um, within BC, total renters, according to the Canadian Rental Housing Index is 219,416 people. Um, and within there are Indigenous identities of 39,920, um, which is higher than Ontario. So it is a large province, which a very high percent of people's identifying as being Indigenous. Any sense of why you think that might be? Why there is a high percent of mm -hmm. like why do you think you see that in the data? Um, yeah, I'm not like entirely sure, but there's just um, I think it, it just goes back to the, the broader system of of the way Canada is founded, and just mm. the entire colonial history and the way uh, Indigenous peoples have been treated systemically throughout Canadian history. And I think there's a lot just going back in that whole, whole system that could be up to where we are today. It's a very perverse irony, of course, because this is a history of stolen land and, and Indigenous people being expelled from their land and then people, Indigenous people being forced into a housing market um, where they are then made again precarious through processes of eviction. So, so is it fair to say that this, this is a, the same logic of colonialism in a sense that's continuing to unfold? Yeah, I think the term that comes to my mind is the circle of dispossession, where land has been dispossessed and continues to be dispossessed. So evictions are not just one event, you know, they're, they're a part of a kind of a continuum of power and, and uh, racism. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can, I can go back. Um, I guess like kind of building on what Nick just asked, what, do you, what did you find in your research follows eviction for people who are at multiple intersections? Like not only are they more vulnerable to eviction, like what comes next for people? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, a, it's a good question, but it, it's such a broad thing and it, it can happen to so many different people. So by no means do I want to like generalize and say this is exactly what's going to happen to each individual because every every person has a different experience, right? And I can't say I've ever lived that fortunate in that aspect. But there's there's any number of things. Say you get priced out of, of the neighborhood you live in, um, then you're forced to move somewhere else from maybe rent is cheaper. And if you have to move there and you have children, you have to find a new place for your, your children to go to school, or you have to get uh, care for them somehow, or um, how do you how do you commute to your job? What if you can't make it back to your job? What if all your social supports are in a certain neighborhood and you can't get back to there? Um, so it it goes far beyond just I can no longer live in my home. It it goes I don't know like where I can access all these other things that I depend on. Right. It's funny we use the word landlord when we talk about tenants. I mean, landlords sounds like something from the Middle Ages, um, right? You know, the, the squire of the manor who has mm -hmm. who has power uh, over the over the peasants in the in the village. Um, I mean, landlords can of course take many forms, and we're going to hear about financialized landlords. Um, but um, I wonder if we can think about landlords and the role of landlords uh, in this uh, in this in this process and people's experience with 
with landlords because um, sometimes there's a positive relationship of course but ultimately tenants can't evict landlords landlords can evict tenants they can sure try they can sure try <laughs> <laughs> you know in, in regards to saying um, uh, landlords i'm just i was just thinking about um, uh, land stewards are your type of landlord which are they sorry land stewards or stewardship uh -huh. Right, that take care of the land and not their type of landlord, right? So, and this mm -hmm. came into my head when we're talking about. So that's a different sort of. So they're not landlords in the same way that they're evicting people, right? Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean they're um, taking care of the environment, but in the same ways they're um, um, like, let's say the big oil company is trying to come in and take over the land, right? We, uh -huh. you know, we fight. To kick them out and somehow they managed to win right mm -hmm. and it's uh it's forever ongoing right and it gets to be really ugly when they have to bring in the army and uh, helicopter people in and they start uh, arresting the elders and all the people who are trying to protect the land and keep it pristine right and um then yeah they end up uh, getting into trouble and um somehow that's gonna bite them in the ass sorry <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah but that gets back to what we were discussing earlier about mm -hmm. different ways of relating to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to land, and because people resist and mm -hmm. tenants resist. So, can you think about resistance? Did you learn about people resisting evictions in the same way that um, uh, Indigenous folk have resisted um, pipelines and so on? Yeah, of course. Um, and there's there's a long long list and of different and varying ways that can be resisted. Um, and just thinking back in recent memory. Uh, to the beginning of the pandemic uh, back in April 2020. With all the uncertainty at the time, there was a couple of notable demonstrations where um, Lord Strathcona School in Vancouver and also a community center in Surrey were, were occupied um, by like people. Yeah, through squatting. So like they that. squatted in those locations. Yeah. yeah, and really bringing light to just how close so many people are to being in a situation of extreme vulnerability to this this issue and bringing light to like how much um, how much support we do need. And then I think that very well could have led to some of the, the COVID measures that were introduced by governments. There's like there was a rent freeze and an eviction moratorium and all that stuff. Um, and so that's kind of all come out of this, although they were permanent solutions, but they've definitely uh, come to light and I think very much inspired by that sort of thing. And then also um, in Burnaby, just down the road, there's, there's a policy that they've implemented now for, for rental renters um, to help them and to help tenants uh, who are often facing rent eviction, for example, so when their houses are being renovated and they're forced out, um, where they can help support them either find a new place to live um, or ensure that they have a spot to come back to when say like their prop the property that they were living on gets redeveloped and make sure that they have a spot and it'll be like at the same same rates that they, they were paying before. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can like push more and, and find solutions like that, that we can implement on a broader scale, I think that would be a, a great step forward. So that relate that power relationship because it is a power relationship can be changed. Yeah. Yeah. Like the idea of a landlord turning into a land steward, which you said, mm -hmm. which I really like, just reworking frameworks and our ideas of things and relationships are fluid in that sense. Yeah. But it's also a market right now. It's people have to make money apparently. We're going to learn more about that very, very, mm -hmm. very soon. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and of course, some landlords are also people with mortgages who have to pay their mortgage uh, because the cost of housing is so high. So, so people are also renting in different sorts of settings, aren't they? I mean, there's the purpose-built rental, but then there's basement suites and, and, and so on. Did you, did you get a sense of that? Different sort of experiences of, of spaces of eviction? Not to what I've seen. Yeah, I think. We didn't get too much into like the, that side of it, but there is definitely that that relationship where it's not it's not just people exploiting the market for the sake of exploiting it. There is obviously like we live in a society where you need to make money. The landlord is often doing just that, so we can't like demonize them all exactly. But um, there's definitely a 
market there that they're trying to make money in. And they're in the same same situations where they need the say you're renting out your basement suite to afford your mortgage. It everyone as Greg kind of mentioned, there you know, regardless of where you access property or how you access the property, you do have likely some sort of vulnerability or rely or you rely on your property through somebody else in some way or another. There's clearly a lot more to say about evictions. No. But thank you very much. Thank really you. appreciate your hard work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can I just show that my landlord made sure to increase my rent as soon as the moratorium ended. <laughs> as soon, like clockwork. Yeah. And I'm sure lots of people who rent got that notice sure of they're... rent increase three months time to the moratorium. The I mean. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure that's that's a that's a common story. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're going to be thinking about landlords uh, in a, the next and third um, presentation, uh, and the third group took on the topic of what's called the financialization of private rental housing in Metro Vancouver. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to find out, and you're going to be, I think, surprised and intrigued. Uh, so the group uh, comprises Connor Holbach, Chris Neil Ram, Kimberly Broadfoot, Eric Ramirez. Uh, Nicholas Lund and Nathan Zemp. And Nathan is, I think, going to join us and present your group's findings. So, Nathan, welcome. Good evening. My name is Nathan Zemp, and off of, on behalf of my group, I will be speaking about the concept of financialization of private rental housing in Metro Vancouver. Financialization is a term used to describe the rising role of finance or money management as opposed to goods production in the modern economy. In the context of real estate, it refers to a change in rental building ownership from small mom and pop landlords and private companies to much larger publicly traded companies. These companies are known as financialized landlords. Real estate investment trusts or REITs for short are the most common kind of financialized landlord. They allow stock traders to invest directly in real estate by buying shares in the REIT. The investors receive dividends from the rental payments that accrue to the REIT. Financialization is significant because although land, all landlords are profit driven, these larger firms tend to have more capital resources that they can use to pursue aggressive strategies for extracting profits. Financialization occurs because it is lucrative and it is lucrative because land values and home prices are consistently increasing. Since 2003, as you can see in the graph, yearly increases in Metro Vancouver property values have been comparable to returns in the stock market. Real estate investment trusts have taken note of this and started buying up apartment buildings. The process of financialization is accelerated by neighborhood zoning. In most neighborhoods in Metro Vancouver, apartments are banned by zoning bylaws. In order to house the 35,000 new residents that move to Metro Vancouver every year, new apartments must be built in the few neighborhoods where they are allowed, which are almost exclusively lower income neighborhoods filled with older apartment buildings. This causes gentrification as existing low income residents are forced out of their neighborhoods and richer residents replace them. Financialization of rental housing empowers privileged financialized landlords and increases the vulnerability of renters. Financialized landlords employ two key strategies to maximize their profits at the expense of renters. The first technique, squeezing, involves maximizing profits by increasing rent or reducing the operating expenses of the building. The second technique, gentrification by upgrading, entails renovating or replacing existing units to attract a richer clientele. This requires the dispossession of existing tenants who are not viewed as profitable enough. While landlords enjoy immense profits from financialization, renters endure the negative impacts. Rent increases from squeezing make it difficult for renters to make ends meet. Residents who are evicted from gentrification by upgrading experience an increased risk of losing their jobs and their community social networks. Those who remain face degraded living conditions due to profit maximizing budget cuts to building maintenance. Together, 
these impacts all intersect to create or exacerbate long lasting physical and mental health problems that disproportionately affect low income families, single parent families, racialized persons and immigrants. Under neoliberal policies of the 1990s and 2000s, governments encouraged home ownership and cut back on social housing. This pushed more Canadian households into financial markets as aspiring home buyers and created a rental market that was increasingly dominated by private investors. Large corporations such as Starlight Investments and REIT were able to accumulate large sums of low rent housing units across Metro Vancouver, evict current low income renters, renovate the units, and then house higher income renters. A quote from Starlight CEO sums up their success. Quote, we think there is a definite housing shortage or almost a crisis level in Canada. And the good news for investors is there is no easy solution in sight. This is not good news for consumers, end quote. There are a number of ways we can resist housing financialization. All of the organizations shown on the slide in one way or another work towards ensuring BC renters have access to safe, comfortable, secure, and affordable housing. Housing Central is a collaborative effort of many stakeholders to advocate for affordable housing in BC, including the BC Nonprofit Housing Association and RentSmart. The Vancouver Tenants Union and the Right to Remain Collective both fight against precarious housing while sharing their lived experience, while RentSmart provides renters education on their rights. In 2019, the Government of Canada introduced the National Housing Council, whose main goals are to investigate the implementation of the right to housing in Canada, as well as create an Indigenous-led body whose main, which creates policy and administers funding for urban, rural, and Northern Indigenous housing. More locally, the City of Vancouver is working to make the approval process for developers easier and incentivizing the creation of nonprofit and co-op housing projects while also taxing empty homes, overall trying to increase the supply of housing. But more must be done to restore affordability in this city. The right to adequate housing has been federally recognized in Canada, but it carries no legal force and applies only to federal jurisdictions. Governmental policies so far have made little progress in addressing the ever skyrocketing housing market. The city of Vancouver has only constructed 6% six six of its goal of 4,000 new below market rental housing units by 2027. To conclude, we'd like to reiterate that houses are not just financial assets. Homes are not meant to make money for other people or to sit empty as the stolen land they rest upon accumulates value. They exist as a place to sleep, to eat, to work, to practice our hobbies and to spend time with the people in our lives. Everyone deserves to have that opportunity to be safe, comfortable, and secure. Thank you for listening to our presentation. If you'd like to learn more, you can check out our poster at the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Um, uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Krishnil Ram and Eric Ramirez to, to join us on the wobbly stools. <laughs> Be careful. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you guys. I've been teaching this, this class where everyone's been wearing masks and suddenly I'm seeing the lower halves of their faces. It's really kind of refreshing. <laughs> That's what Eric and Krishna look like. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, awesome to be here, folks. Okay. Eric, thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, so financialization, um, who wants to kick off on, on that? I'm horrified. horrified? I'm horrified at this <laughs> new word that I learned today, thanks to your excellent presentation. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was telling my group, I think uh, we deserve an economics major now after uh, <laughs> this topic. At the very least, a certificate. Like, like, how did you feel like uncovering this larger force that's kind of unseen to most of us? Yeah, I feel like it really uncovered a lot of uh, issues which are present, especially in uh, Vancouver and the uh, Lower Mainland in general. 
uh, we uh, a lot of uh, a lot of us here have known how expensive housing has gotten, especially over the past 20 years. Uh, what might have been affordable 20 years ago is uh, essentially completely out of reach for the average uh, uh, 20 uh, 20 something year old nowadays. It's amazing that quote that Nathan gave, where the housing crisis is actually good for my, good for business. Um, how did that make you feel, Krishna? Yeah, honestly, um, when I found that quote, it really shows the two sides of the story here. You have your capital, private investors, and even big firms like Starlight Investments, who are benefiting largely from um, financialization of housing. And then you have the uh, second side, or the other side of the story, where who's at effect is renters. And they're really becoming more vulnerable through this relationship from one party you know, getting many benefits from another one, becoming more vulnerable. Yeah, and also uh, back in 1999, there was another REIT. Uh, in their uh, yearly report, their main tagline was apartments make money. So it does say a lot about the state of housing in the country. I think relatedly, you, you touched briefly in your presentation on the sort of role of neoliberal policies in this shift. Can you speak a bit more to that on what those policies how they've had an effect. Thank you for your question. I may pass it to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, specialized in the economics. Yeah, no uh, yeah neoliberalism, it's, it's a big topic. Uh, through my research and with the help of my team, we discovered that it's really the role of the state. And uh, through neoliberalism, it's kind of the re-regulation and re-ruling of what the state entails. So under housing, it would it's the state being less involved in providing social rental housing, as we saw in the presentation through that, uh, those graph there, that uh, showed the decline of social rental housing produced in Canada um, after neoliberal housing policies were introduced. That also includes um, a reduction in providing rent controls, which is a big factor. And now, uh, which leads to um, a private, private rental market that's really controlled by the private investors more than the, uh, the state. Yeah, and to build on to that point, uh, with the uh, lack of public housing and social housing that were built, uh, especially in the past 20 years, uh, you see that gap being filled, unfortunately, by financialized landlords and, uh, uh, and large entities that are building these uh, housing units, which are built to be profitable. Uh, that's why you do see a lot of uh, new market rental housing becoming so expensive, especially as you can see in the city of Vancouver, uh, with previous groups that did present on uh, rental evictions, you've seen that it's very difficult to re-enter the market after you've been evicted out of your unit because you can no longer afford the rents that are in where you used to live. Do you want to talk about the example of uh, Heron's Gate, Heron Gate in Toronto? Should I go for that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so Huron Gate Village, uh, for the folks who are not aware of what it is, it's a, a community, it's a community in Ottawa, I believe in the South End. And Huron Gate Village, uh, about a couple years ago, I don't remember the exact uh, timeline, uh, there was the uh, developer for that property and they renovated uh, many individuals and many families. Uh, Huron Gate Village, uh, is a very ethnically diverse community. And so for many of the individuals and families that were evicted out of their uh, townhouses, it created a very large rift, especially with community connections, uh, because those were very tight knit communities and to be uh, sent out of those homes and dispersed into the community or the surrounding communities meant a loss of that community. Didn't that happen here? Like in Mount Pleasant? Mm. <laughs> yes, there was also a development in Mount Pleasant. I actually cannot remember the name. I myself am from Surrey, so I'm not too familiar with the uh, with uh, surrounding communities, especially in those developments. But that but that raises a really interesting question because I mean, in 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 some, particularly in the states, financialization is is rampant, um, uh, and I my sense is that we haven't we're beginning to see it in Vancouver, um, and but we have yet really to kind of. It really has yet to take off, although Starlight is a, is a major player. Is that is that your understanding of kind of where we are on the curve in terms of Metro Vancouver? Yeah, uh, through my research, I found that Starlight Investments has really been taken off since 
I think it was 2001 to 2010, they really take off. And then it hit a plateau, but it's right now, um, I just read an article recently where Star Investment just accumulated 456 units on, um, I think it's in Victoria and uh, they renovated the area. So they removed the current tenants and uh, upgraded the property and now charge higher rents that these uh, previous renters cannot afford to live in their community anymore. And now they're pushed farther out. And it really shows that this is the, I guess, trajectory of financialization of housing in Metro Vancouver. And it is emanated through across North America, I would say. Mm -hmm. So thin end of the wedge. We said we're going to see more of this, do you think? think yeah, we, would, we will see more of this as uh, prices continue to rise. But uh, until there's certain actions taking place, as we saw through the presentation, a lot of action that has taken place is not really effective. Mm -hmm. And so we can find a really effective solution. I think the, the trend will continue. Because what was the stat? Something like 25% of, of purpose-built rental housing in Canada is owned by 20%. I'm putting you on the yeah, spot. It, but it's, it's about 20, 20 to 25, I believe, that is owned by uh, these corporations, right? I think that's correct. Yeah. 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 So given that context, how do you think more affordable housing could be achieved? So one of the strategies that uh, could work out in the city of Vancouver especially is by relaxing zoning regulations. Uh, so for the folks both in person and online, uh, on our poster, there is going to be a chart that shows a map of uh, Vancouver. And you, what you will see essentially is a large uh, portion of the city is zoned for single family residential homes. And the only alternative really is either those condominiums that are along the major corridors of the city or downtown. Now with these strict zoning regulations, there's no other allowed uses uh, for these neighborhoods. So what you essentially end up with is only two options, condominiums and apartments or single family homes. Now, the difficulties with that is that there's a lack of, uh, there's a lack of uh, middle housing, which is a combination of townhomes and other types of uh, uh, housing arrangements. And by relaxing zoning regulations, we're able to diversify these communities, uh, which I'm gonna differentiate from uh, gentrification. Uh, I'm just talking about the different type of housing uh, options that are available in the community. And what this will allow uh, to happen in these areas is that you will have more housing choice. And by allowing for that choice, you will be able to uh, cater to a wide range of either family sizes or communities, ethnic groups as well. And that can also help out with pricing, especially with a lot of folks who are now moving out to the Fraser Valley or to other communities where housing is cheaper or housing is more accessible. Did you want to add anything to that? I think you got it all there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know there's a lot of resistance to, to expanding rental housing into um, these more single family houses. So this gets back to local politics in some ways, maybe, and uh, uh, some of the politics and struggle around that. Uh, do other folk have questions they wanted to, to add? Do you think that governments also want to like profit through financialization by selling their, because that's like, that's revenue for them, right? If they can sell off this property, um, like Little Mountain to a private company, it, do you think that that's gonna be a trend? <laughs> uh, big question, but um, I think on our poster, we actually have a decent solution to that or an answer to that, but, um, basically, there's many taxes and lease taxes that the government can benefit on. And it is, I would say that there is a stream of income that does go to the government, but I'm not entirely sure if it is that profitable compared to, you know, having more houseless people because of, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it would increase the, uh, the health tax and mm -hmm. so on, right? Great. Good. Thank you so much, Krishnil and Eric. Thank Appreciate you. you. So, so in the previous three presentations, we explored real world examples of housing injustice and precarity. Um, but as we know, 
these are never contested. And the final group is going to introduce us to housing justice movements uh, that challenge these oppressions and, and craft new narratives. Uh, the group comprises Justin Lau, Marina Hussain, Leo Dittmer, Jonathan Ling, and Ryan Van Sees, and Natalie Bodenschance. And Natalie is going to present the findings of this group. So Natalie, thank you for joining us. All right, so housing justice movements. What does that even mean? Housing justice is the assurance of stable, high quality, affordable, and safe housing to residents of all income levels. Housing justice movements urge that housing is a human right and an essential good to be protected. Through collective action, residents of the downtown east side fight racial banishment by educating themselves, questioning current laws, and at times they push through the laws when necessary. Why is there a need for housing justice? It is because there is a divide between the housing landscape of the wealthy and the housing crisis experienced by marginalized communities. These marginalized communities make up the downtown east side. They are forced into vulnerability through colonization, racism, gentrification, commodification, and capitalism. However, it is through these nodes of struggle that residents come together and form resistance against their extermination and erasure. How do housing justice movements fight vulnerability? First, they produce and use knowledge. This is particularly true of movements that struggle against historical forms of injustice, which more often than not lack the conventional resources of money, political influence, and institutional power. They transform historic forms of injustice by producing alternative political trajectory of a society. For example, removing the name Skid Row from the Vancouver area and renaming it the downtown east side is to show outsiders its stability. Or through actions such as the youth did by taking up space on Kiefer Street by setting up Mahjong tables to show their resistance against gentrification. Another is challenging the prevailing status quo that dictates housing as an asset above it being a right. Finally, housing justice movements discuss housing in a manner purposefully different than those in power positions. They often reveal the prejudices encased in the current system and present alternative narratives. For example, stating that gentrification and its transformation is not about integration. It is a modern form of settler colonialism. By addressing property relations and the associations of personhood born from it, housing justice movements combat vulnerability. So can housing justice movements really make a difference? Yes, and we're all gonna take a look at one example. Here we have 105 Kiefer, a proposed 12 story, 100 unit condo development with only 25 social housing units. It was proposed in 2017 for the corner of Kiefer and Quebec Street. Situated in the heart of Chinatown, 105 Kiefer is near multiple Chinatown landmarks, such as the Chinese Cultural Center, the Chinatown Memorial Monument, and the Chinatown Plaza, which hosts the largest Chinese restaurant in Vancouver. The construction of this development was unwanted because it would bring in new white wealthy residents and it would permanently change the character of Chinatown. Low income housing and other small Chinese businesses would be at risk via gentrification if the city allowed this development to proceed. As a result, protests sprung up around the site and spilled into public hearings at City Hall. There are four groups that are involved in the fight for the 105 Kiefer development. First, we have BD Development. They are the developers of this project and want to bring in market condos. Second, we have young Chinatown activists such as the Youth Collaborative for Chinatown. They are a group of young Chinese Canadians who are concerned with the needs, aspirations, 
desires, and visions of community members. Through speeches, rallies, and protests at City Hall, they demanded that 105 Kiefer proposed condo development be turned into 100% social housing. Third, we have Chinese seniors who live in low-cost housing and require culturally appropriate services, such as banking and healthcare. And finally, the Vancouver Planning Development Board. Those are the ones who approve developments. Public hearings for this project lasted an unprecedented amount of days as Chinese seniors and youth activists spoke out against the 105 Kiefer project. Here are some of the reasons, here are some of the concerns they expressed for, at the hearing against gentrification at Chinatown. Chinese seniors are finding it difficult to communicate around Chinatown as there are many non-Chinese stores opening up. Housing is so expensive for young people and low-income people, so Chinatown should not be developed for personal profits. Zoning replacement was designed to replace Chinatown. As a result of these hearings and other forms of resistance, such as protests at City Hall and taking over space on Kiefer Street, the planning board rejected the BD application. This is extremely significant because it was the first time in 15 years that the planning board rejected an application. Activists were successfully able to stop gentrification at 105 Kiefer. While this is one example of how housing, a housing justice movement fought against gentrification and was successful, there are many organizations that support the vulnerable and help resist the ongoing injustices of property space in the downtown east side. Please come check out our poster for more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Natalie, for, for, for that story, a powerful narrative. So I'd like to invite um, Leo Dittmer and Jonathan Lane, two other members of the group, to join us on stage for some Q&A. Jonathan, Leo, great to see you. Right, thank you for having us. <laughs> Wonderful you're here. Yeah. Um, uh, that was a remarkable, I remember that well, when the development board turned that down, I think. Even the activists were surprised. Um, it was it was unprecedented, but it really speaks to the power of, of resistance and, and housing housing justice and the, the potential. I think it's important as we as we begin to come to an end to to reflect on that uh, on the potential and possibility of, of housing resistance. Um, what do people want to uh, pose for our presenters? Mm. Yeah, thank you all for being here and uh, thank you for you guys doing a really good job. Like kudos to you all and I'm pretty, hopefully you'll all do very well. I'm just, um, um, in regards to um, gentrification and housing, how do you think um, more affordable housing could be achieved in Vancouver, downtown east side or just in the lower mainland? Um, I think definitely a big factor of that is stopping treating housing as a commodity. Um, a lot of housing justice movements, you hear the refrain, housing is a human right. Um, and in order to successfully achieve that, we need to prioritize putting people into homes instead of having homes be sources of income for people who already, quite frankly, have enough income. So in order for there to be more affordable housing, it's really a mindset shift um, to where we start prioritizing people over the needs of capital. Yeah, one of the alternative ways of having, you know, affordable housing is to make more co-op housing, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very prominent model around uh, the so we definitely need more of that. I think uh, co-op housing, um, there's a lot of people that can't, don't really understand how co-op housing works and a lot of them, um, um, their financial status will make it so they can't go to co-op housing. Um, I mean, it's a good idea for people to understand it who aren't into it, but a lot of people aren't into sharing their, their whole being, you know, with other people. I mean, if they move in somewhere, they expect to have their, a lot of people expect to have their uh, privacy and um, security and safety, right? So just my thoughts on it. <laughs> for sure. There needs to be probably a big variety of problem solving 
solutions. <laughs> Maggie, did you want to chip in? I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what happened after the verdict, how, what has transpired yeah. since then. Thanks for the question. Well, you know, uh, it's not really over for me. Uh, they decided to go to court after this mm -hmm. because they felt that the city had the wow. planning board who, who rejected this uh, uh, development. Mm -hmm. uh, they had overstepped their boundaries, that mm -hmm. they had broken several bylaws. So they sued the city of Vancouver and uh, wanted the decision to be overturned. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't get it overturned. It's actually gone up to the BC Court of Appeal. And, uh, you know, they, they still haven't gotten it overturned. And uh, uh, they only got the city to release the document. So at this point, the 105 Kiefer is still a parking lot. I think they were expecting the permit to go through, weren't they? I think they were rather surprised when the city mm. didn't do what it usually does, yeah. which is maybe make a few cosmetic changes and then a lot because it was a rezoning, wasn't it? Too, it wasn't just a, um, it didn't fit to the fit the zoning pattern as it stood. So, landlord's gonna landlord. <laughs> <what's> gonna happen? <laughs> Developers gonna develop. Exactly. <laughs> um, I get like in kind of seeing your presentation at the end of the series like for you folks who are like in your undergrad like thinking about like next steps and then seeing the forces that are kind of undermining right like undermining the future that you might have unless you're like ultra wealthy in which case like why are you going to school like just <laughs> get your parents to buy your degree like um what do you think the point of housing justice is like how do you see it impacting your future personally um, i think something that actually really clicked for me this semester was that um, so many good things um, that we see in society right now have been born out of previous resistance uh, that a lot of the time I didn't know about before. Um, so even if it seems like, you know, like when we first started this project, it was really hard to imagine that these really small organizations and these movements could take on somebody like, for instance, BD Development um, was an incredible force in the city, um, just has so many resources at their disposal. Um, but then actually through also taking Dr. Ramirez's class this semester, I realized that we see um, so many like long threads of resistance that have like blossomed into these really good things today. We just don't necessarily always know the origins of them. Um, so I think I'm kind of holding on to that, that we just mm -hmm. need to keep up with that sort of resistance. Um, even if we don't know exactly what we're doing or where it's going, <laughs> um, it's important to keep it that way. I love your optimism, that's great. Um, oh, what what Go ahead. I, I was just looking at the one question here and um, thinking about Kiefer and um, um, what are to you, what are some of the forces that caused gentrification in Chinatown? Well, you kind of have to look at its history because uh, Chinatown used to be just the only place that Chinese people could live. Mm -hmm. But over the years, uh, Chinese people got to move out because they were you know, more integrated into Canadian society as they were able to work in professionals. So they moved away. So that's one of the reasons why uh, we have this force of gentrification. The second force is that there's an undervaluing of land in uh, Chinatown. So the developers just uh, just invested in it. And that's why we have uh, this 105 key for developments. Hmm. It's being rebranded too, isn't it? Chinatown in some ways. Um, hmm. uh, it's a sort of hip and fashionable. Um, so we see the, the name Crosstown popping up more and more. Right, where's Cross, cro where's Cross Town? Remind us where that is. Cross Town. That's an <laughs> a new <excellent> <laughs> question. Um, according to a marketing website we found, it sort of overlaps Chinatown and Gastown and wherever else they feel Cross like. Town. Just so like the four corners, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, today you see Cross Town Elementary School, which is next to oh, Stadium true. Chinatown Station. That's true. Okay. Crosstown lives in a developer's imagination. Right. Yes. <laughs> right? Being invented. It's here. <laughs> I wonder if just sort of related to Manakshi's question as well, like if there's after we've heard, you know, this whole evening about all these different layers, of the housing crisis. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us like what would be like a takeaway that we could take from the housing justice movement? Like what is sort of a aspiration of what housing justice organizers are, are hoping the sort of future we could build? 
I think a lot of what they do is that theoretical work. Um, mm -hmm. Natalie did a really great job of summarizing some of the practical work that, you know, for instance, um, the Youth Collaborative for Chinatown kind of spearheaded at one of five key for. Um, but opposing justice movements do a lot of important work when it comes to sort of challenging that dominant narrative in society. So they're kind of saying, you know, rather than housing being for an investment, it should be housing people. You know, these people that you're undervaluing because of their identity or where they live or they're, you know, maybe because they don't have homes, they're challenging that as well. So it is a lot of challenging the sort of hedge money. Mm -hmm. Sort of flipping the script of what we value. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your, uh, your, your time and effort. The train has to move, so uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. So, so, so this uh, this concludes the, the formal part of the of the evening. And for those of you who are uh, with us at three twelve, I would encourage you to stay for a little longer. Uh, there are some refreshments available if the students haven't eaten them all. Um, uh, please do check out the student posters at the back and chat with them about their their uh, their work. For those of you who are online, uh, links to the posters have been I understand dropped in the chat. Uh, and they'll also be shared with all attendees in a follow-up email. So everyone's going to access all this hard work. So before we close, I'd like to extend a thank you again to SFU Public Square for their, for their hard work. Thanks also to the SFU Woodward's technical team who made this all seamless and wonderful. Uh, and the volunteers who have also graciously assisted in, uh, in the event. And thanks also to Sarah Zhang, the geography liaison librarian, who came in uh, to my class to help with to help the students. Uh, my thanks also to the wonderful panelists for your involvement. But I really want to uh, end by thanking the, the students who worked incredibly hard uh, in their presentations. One of them told me he'd never worked quite so hard in his class, in a class <laughs> before, uh, which I took to be a compliment. But uh, so, so thank you all. Uh, thank you all to them for all their hard work. I think we should give them a round of applause.